presentation mode. Yes. yes. So it is indeed an honor to introduce Lou, Lee Cooper. I've known Lee since what, 2004 or 2005. So he, I was one of his mentors and uh, Kishore Maslaganti and Lee Cooper, they were working on uh, you know, the same problem, which is essentially looking at you know, 1,000 whole slide images of placentas, mass placentas, right? And uh, doing something with them, right? So this was a phenotyping study. So Lee was always, you know, wonderful in everything he did. And, uh, you know, he's done great things even after he finished at Ohio State. He finished, uh, you know, his, he got his degree in 2009 and joined uh, Emory as a postdoctoral fellow with, uh, with, with Joel Salz and others. Then he became faculty at Emory and then, um, and Emory and Georgia Tech, it's, it was a, it's a joint venture, right? And uh, in 2012, his, re his move to Northwestern is more recent. He's an associate professor of pathology at Northwestern University. Lee is unique because he not only understands computer science and, you know, and engineering, but he also you know, has a pretty good uh, you know, understanding of biology and pathology. And uh, so what he does you know, at Northwestern is to develop software platforms for the management and analysis of data. Also, you know, he also conducts fundamental you know, research, right, in machine learning methods. So look at his papers, right? You know, the, the, the cell paper, the PNAS papers. I mean, they, they, they talk about very specific design of deep neural networks, okay? And, and, uh, and, and not only he works on imaging, but also he works on combining imaging with genomic data. His work is very well funded by all the institutes at NIH and industry and foundations. So with no further ado, I give the floor back, floor to uh, Lee Cooper, a good friend and a colleague here. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be introduced by, by Raghu and uh, it's good to be with Ohio State people. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. I think you should be able to, right? So let yeah. me pause share. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to try and do it the slick way here, which is so I can see my notes. And let's see if this is going to work. Does this look appropriate? Yep. OK. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the organizers. I've just really enjoyed the talks. Um, you know, in this area of informatics, of computational pathology, there is just tremendous strength in this region. And I think that's uh, another thing that's unique uh, about our field is, um, you know, it's not just sort of concentrated on the coasts. I think really the heart here is, is in the Midwest. So uh, as Regu said, I'm an engineer. I'm not a pathologist, but in 2019, I took the plunge and joined uh, the pathology department at Northwestern. Uh, I have a relationship with our chair. We've worked on a lot of problems in neuro-oncology. And here I, I direct a small division that's devoted to computation uh, and also a center in our Feinberg School of Medicine that's looking at AI and uh, imaging and also sort of waveform type, you know, signal analytics. Um, disclosures, it's not a recent one, but we had some sponsored research from Roche Tissue Diagnostics 2017. Um, so, you know, I, I've given a lot of talks recently, so I tried to kind of mix this up and also, you know, um, highlighting some of the things that have come before me in this workshop. Uh, without too much repetition. A little bit of repetition is maybe good. Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of background of my perspective on this field, how we got to this moment, and what I think the kind of near future looks like. Um, you know, that's talking about some of the challenges we have, and then some kind of illustrative applications. So uh, some of the themes that will come up, and they'll sort of cut across the different application areas, and come up in different parts of the talk are you know, the brittleness of deep learning and how we often see failure of real world deployments, why that is, uh, what we can do to try to um, you know, challenge these algorithms more during validation. Um, the commoditization of machine learning and how you know, if you have adequate data, a lot of these sort of off the shelf algorithms that come in packages like PyTorch and TensorFlow work very good. Uh, I think that's an important trend that's gonna have a big impact on our field and shift more of the emphasis towards data. Um, challenges in handling outcomes and observational data. I think, you know, um, 
Mike Basich talked about this a little bit with their Center for Causal Analysis. I think this is another really kind of important topic that impacts our ability to learn, you know, new prognostic signals from data sets that exist. Um, we'll talk about labeling and how we can improve efficiency of labeling and scalability. This is a really critical, uh, critically important problem. Um, and then also discuss the importance of uh, data sharing and improved tooling for working with data. So I would put our field up against any other field when it comes to scale and complexity of data, certainly in terms of societal impact. You know, the pathology lab is going through a lot of revolutions with, you know, the introduction of whole site imaging. You know, before that we had next generation sequencing. I won't talk about that as much, but, you know, within the hospital, I think, you know, there's just the amount of data and the interest, the uh, complexity of the data we're generating in the pathology lab is tremendous. And, uh, you know, we looked at how, do, how would we digitize 10 years of slides at Northwestern? We're talking about, you know, roughly 13 petabytes of data before you even back anything up. And that's just looking at, you know, bright field images. Um, both Mike and uh, Yuli talked in, about, you know, these next generation platforms, um, single cell sequencing, multiplex immunofluorescence. These are things that are currently used in research. I think, you know, they're exciting. Uh, you know, it's going to unlock a lot of, um, you know, mysteries about cancer and disease and biology. Uh, and these things would, have, I expect, eventually make their way into clinical use. And so if you imagine, you know, the future of this field, it's only going to get, you know, larger scale and more and more complex, more interesting. So that's really, I think, what sort of drove me to get into this field. Of course, I didn't know about single cell sequencing back in 2004, but it was, it was a lot more interesting than some of the alternatives, which we're looking at, you know, communications data or radar, things like that. Um, so, you know, if you, if you watch popular media, it makes it seem like machine learning is taking over the world. And so uh, in the area of pattern recognition, you know, we've had these things like ImageNet and Coco, where people have essentially developed machines that do pattern recognition tasks, you know, classification of general image categories, detection of objects uh, with, you know, superhuman precision. And that happened very rapidly. Um, you know, sort of the advent of deep learning, um, what people I think call deep learning now, uh, sort of started in 2012. We saw a big reduction in, in error in, in some of these challenges. And now, you know, we've surpassed sort of human level of performance. Um, if you go beyond pattern recognition, which is I think is kind of a, the most trivial type of application, and you look at things that involve control or strategy, um, there are machines that are, you know, beating the world champions at games like Go, or you know, playing sort of action and strategy oriented games and beating you know, teams of humans um, you know, that are world champions in those fields. So you know, it's led to a lot of hype. I mean, it's a very exciting result, certainly. It's a departure from what we had before where machine learning was just kind of a toy, um, but it's led to some you know, kind of grandiose statements about how you know, we're not gonna need to train radiologists in the future. Uh, that was a statement by Jeff Hinton, who is one of the sort of fathers of deep learning. Uh, Henry Kissinger wrote an article in Atlantic about how AI is going to end the enlightenment. Um, I think that, you know, as you start to scrutinize these, these really, um, you know, news getting headlines, you sort of see that there are some peculiar things about these applications that I think are very different from medicine. So, um, you know, in the case of ImageNet, you have categories that anybody can label. And so, you know, it, when we're talking about medical images, it requires some expertise. And so it's really hard to generate data sets of 14 million labeled medical images. Um, when it comes to uh, this application of um, you know, playing games, uh, those are scenarios where you have a, an environment that is, you know, completely described with rules or with software, and you can simulate outcomes. And so when we're talking about medicine, you know, you can't really simulate outcomes with patients. So you don't have that ability to just synthesize training data. So, you know, I don't really think that we're going to see, you know, the same type of, you know, rapid improvements in medicine. It's, it's just much more challenging. But there has been, I think, some, some very interesting and promising results in computational pathology. You know, if you're in this area, you're, you're familiar with these. Um, there's a challenge called chameleon where people developed algorithms and would compete to detect metastases. Uh, of breast cancer and lymph node sections. And they showed that uh, machines and humans without time constraints are comparable. If you add time constraints to humans, then machines can you know, essentially do better. 
I think that really highlights the importance of having kind of open data and a challenge environment where people come and compete and there's motivation to get recognition. Um, that's certainly a very important result in our field. Uh, at MSK, you know, they have uh, a very large repository and made big investments in digital infrastructure. And we're able to show that you can use very coarse slide level labels to, to train something uh, like a prostate cancer detector that's extremely accurate. You know, so without delineating the areas of tumor, just using sort of case or slide level labels, you can train systems to do that. But you just need a very massive amount of slides. Uh, and so that's an example of you know, how weak labels or multiple instance learning can come into play and just present really incredible machine learning challenges. Um, another interesting paper that got a lot of attention was predicting mutations from uh, H&E images of, uh, of lung cancer, uh, sorry, gastrointestinal cancer in this case. And so they looked at mismatch repair genes and showed that you can, you know, with a reasonable accuracy, predict mutations from H&E images. And I think this really highlights the importance of having public data like TCGA, where you have um, histology that's linked to genomic data. So if you look at a lot of the challenges in, in pathology right now uh, and, and what the field is facing, it sort of dovetails nicely with what machine learning might be able to do. So there's really a lot of demand increase for pathologist services, but at the same time, there's a declining number of practicing pathologists in the US. So from 20, 2000, or sorry, 2007 to 2017, there was a 17.5% decline, decline in the number of practicing pathologists. Yeah, uh, and at the same time, a, a big increase in diagnostic workload. I think Jose talked about a lot of the reasons why, uh, you know, cancer inc incidence is increasing, and so you know this is a, a kind of a crisis. And so you know, one of the things we could do is to try to think about how machine learning can uh, sort of try to fill this gap and improve efficiency, um, taking care of tasks that are maybe you know more trivial, uh, and allowing pathologists to focus more on interesting things. So, you know, there's also a challenge of delivering specialization where it's needed. Digital pathology is very helpful for that. You, know, you can do consultations remotely with people out in, in you know, rural areas, um, but, you know, if all the pathologists are busy, that's not very helpful. So, you know, one of the things machine learning might be able to do is to help pathologists, you know, that are generalists elevate their performance and deliver care where it's needed. You know, there's also the familiar challenges with uh, intra and intra-observer variability of pathologic diagnosis. Um, you know, some of the predictive features that may be observable by pathologists and images may not be reproducibly scorable. And that's another area where having kind of quantitative features, a lot of the things that kind of are not talked about could be very beneficial. And, you know, even the development of diagnostic and prognostic criteria are based on kind of subjective evaluations. And maybe if we can make those criteria based on quantitative features, um, we could you know, increase diagnostic accuracy, increase prognostic accuracy. So I think you know, some good goals or a vision for computational pathology, this is not complete, but this is sort of what I think about, is you know, giving everybody in the world a gold standard diagnosis. Um, and you could think about how through the magic of cloud computing and the internet, you, know, you could really sort of, um, you know, have that sort of expertise provided by machines and, you know, penetrate, you know, all areas of the world. Um, improving, you know, diagnostic and prognostic criteria. I, I mentioned that in my previous slide. Uh, helping pathologists, you know, improve their work lives. If you go to the faculty meetings, there's a lot of groaning about the amount of work. Uh, you know, we need to think about uh, how we can help our pathologists uh, meet demand and, and have work-life balance. You know, there's a lot of discussion about diagnostics. I think the potential for research is also unlimited. So, you know, a lot of the studies that involve histology involve some kind of uh, subjective evaluation of slides, you know, scoring one, two, three. Um, if we could really advance computational pathology to where it's like a commodity or a service, just like genomics, I think that would have a huge impact on science. And we're not there yet, but I think, you know, there's some promising things, you know, some of the work that um, I'm not mentioned with, you know, quick annotation and efficient annotation, I'll mention some of that later, you know, that's sort of pointing in that direction of being able to put tools in the hands of researchers and sort of taking people like me, you know, out of the loop. Um, you know, image analysis actually has been used in medical labs for quite a while, and I think that's something that's often overlooked. 
So the first FDA approved system for cervical cytology was in sort of the mid nineties. Um, I don't think that system is used anymore, but in, in 2003, there was a system developed by a company called Cytec that got FDA approval for a uh, liquid based cervical cytology screening system. And so what this system does is to look at, you know, essentially pap smears uh, to highlight suspicious areas for people to review. And this has become, you know, so commonly used there are you know, there's guidance on, you know, how many uh, slides need to be re uh, manually reviewed if they're, if you have one of these computational systems in place, they have some rules based on sort of the rate of positive cases at a given institute. And based on that, you calculate, um, you know, your sort of manual review rate. And so, you know, this, this system is interesting. There's not any deep learning here. It's just sort of image analysis. And I think really the secret of why this works so well is they have very precise control over the sample preparation. So the creation of the slide. So the sample is in a liquid form. They can take that liquid and, and do all of the processes within the system, uh, the fixation and, and everything, and then very precisely print the sample on a slide, um, which is you know, not a luxury we have when we're dealing with solid, solid tumors. Um, there's also, it's not just uh, in, in cytology, there's also a list of IHC algorithms that are FDA approved. Uh, you can find that on uh, the Digital Pathology Association website. So um, when we're talking about uh, computational pathology, I think really the big problem right now is, you know, pre-analytic variability. And so when we're dealing with these solid samples, we have these noisy physical processes. Um, there's sectioning, which is very mechanical. Um, you know, we have to fixate them. And so, you know, getting all of the, um, you know, uh, fixation and, you know, deep into the tissue and having that be uniform and standardized, that's very difficult. Um, staining, you know, you can sort of somewhat precisely control that, but, um, you know, it's just much more challenging dealing with these uh, solid specimens. Um, we also have variability from one imaging system to another. It's due to optics and software compression. I think that's more systematic. We can probably address that in some ways, but the sort of physical processes are very hard to control. And, you know, up to now, there really hasn't been a reason to do it. You know, humans are very good at sort of compensating for differences in staining or thickness, things like that. Um, but now that we want to apply algorithms, we need to maybe pay more attention to that, that point. Um, so some of the paradigms that, you know, people are proposing for how computational pathology systems would work. Um, there's a first read or screening system, kind of like the cytology machine I described. And so here a computer would do the first read and then pathologists would only review high risk slides or regions. You know, this is where you would get really big gains in efficiency, um, but there's also increased risk. I mean, you know, if a, if a machine, you know, misses something, you know, and the pathologist is not gonna look at it, you know, you have a big problem. So here the risk is, you know, of machine error. Um, you know, you could also think of second read systems. There have been some interesting results uh, on this coming out of places like Israel and Maccabi where they have a pathologist does the first read, a computer does a parallel second read, and then you look at contradictions where the pathologist and the computer disagree. And so here, you, you know, you, you don't have any efficiency gains um, if the pathologist is, you know, doing things carefully, um, but you do have, you know, decreased risk. So you're getting that second read. And so you're, you're catching things that maybe the pathologist potentially missed. Um, then there's assisted read, which I think is very interesting. And this is where you get into kind of human machine teaming. So, you know, somebody sitting down and receiving guidance, you know, interactively from an algorithm. And, you know, I would say that in this case, efficiency and accuracy gains are maybe hard to realize for subspecialists. Um, you know, there could be some ways to elevate generalist performance. I think, you know, some of the people at Google have looked at that with their prostate grading. Um, accuracy gains, you know, you could think of assisted reading is where you could use some of these quantitative features and, you know, looking at patterns of cells and morphology in ways that are hard for pathologists to reproducibly score. And this might be a, a good way to do that. So that's, this is often what we think about when, when we're doing computational pathologies, how to create these assisted read types of systems. Um, there are also different paradigms in terms of how you apply the machine learning. So um, a lot of the studies that I think get a lot of attention are these end-to-end -end studies where you go from pixels to some endpoints. So from H&E directly to, you know, whether this person has a mutation or not, um, or, you know, what survival is, we've done studies like that. 
Um, and that's sort of really the, the power of deep learning is to learn from raw data and labels and just to you know, have a black box system that has very high predictive accuracy. Um, you know, not did a really nice talk uh, about feature engineering and you know, how maybe you could use deep learning instead to delineate tissue regions and structures and cells and then to build on top of that features that you know, incorporate some uh, prior knowledge or some domain knowledge, but in a way that you're making measurements that are precise and quantitative. Uh, maybe those measurements are um, measuring things that pathologists already use. Uh, maybe they're looking at things like you know, stromal patterns that pathologists see, but are very hard to sort of score reliably. And I think you know, that's really, I think, the direction to go in if you want systems that you know, can be explained and can go through some type of validation like a test would in pathology. So he has a very nice review on this. You know, I think it, there's a paper that, that we really like in my lab, which is uh, by Cynthia Rudin at Duke. And I think maybe not mentioned this. And it says, you know, stop explaining black box machine learning models for high stakes decisions and use interpretable models instead. And I think that's, I, I really agree with that perspective. And that's where I think the feature engineering has a, a really big advantage over this sort of end-to-end -end pipeline. Um, the reason why these end-to-end -end pipelines are so risky is just because of sort of the core lived nature of, of uh, deep learning. And so if you look at an example of um, ways that deep learning algorithms can break down, uh, you can take an image of a pig, you can add some imperceptible noise to that image so that you, you, know, you don't really see a difference between the pig on the right and the pig on the left. Um, but a deep learning algorithm will now misclassify this pig as, an, as being an airliner. So this noise is not completely random. It's generated in kind of a systematic way, but it's imperceptible. And so I would argue that, you know, a human being would never misclassify this image on the right. You know, everyone's going to say that's a pig. But, you know, these deep learning algorithms can really break down very easily. And so, you know, they're very bad at extrapolation. So where you have your training data, um, you know, you can, you can sort of guarantee some performance, um, but, you know, the training data does not really cover the entire space of possibilities. And so often when you take a system and you deploy it, even if you've done a very good job in building a training set, um, you'll find that in practice, your algorithm is often extrapolating. And so that leads to unpredictable behavior. You know, uh, that's why I think, you know, machines will not completely replace pathologists. Certainly deep learning will not. Um, like I said, we have that problem with pre-analytical pre variability, which is just tremendous. Um, it's very hard to get enough labels to build systems based on deep learning. And you have a lot of rare phenomena that come up in pathology. And I just don't think, you know, uh, a paradigm of deep learning that's built on, you know, generating, you know, collecting labels for training of, you know, thousands of cases is going to work in some of those examples. So, you know, another thing that often comes up is, you know, people see the predictive accuracy of deep learning systems and they think, oh, these, these must really understand something that's happening. It, absolutely not. So these systems are purely correlative. There's really no intelligence. Um, I think, you know, Judea Pearl, who's at UCLA put it best. He said, you know, all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting. So we have to really think, keep that in mind as we see, you know, some of these, you know, tremendous, you know, uh, predictive accuracy uh, numbers when we look at these papers. So machine learning is very prone, uh, uh, deep learning is very prone to learning spurious correlations and shortcuts. So we saw, for example, in our work where we're predicting uh, clinical outcomes for glioma patients, um, this, the deep learning algorithm will focus on blood and the abundance of blood and relate that to clinical outcome. Well, you know, highly vascular tumors are more likely to have advanced grade, and so they're going to have more blood on the samples. But you know, there are other ways to get blood on samples. You know, just depending on how the tissues cut, etc. So, you know, that's an example of kind of a shortcut. These algorithms will often just look for these bright, bold signals, and if that correlates with the label, you know, you might have good accuracy on your training or validation set. But in practice, you'll come up with scenarios where the system will just completely break down. So, you know, we see this in self-driving cars and a lot of systems where we try to deploy these things in the real world. And so I think, you know, even if you're trying to create realistic conditions for validation, it's very hard to do that. Uh, even if you're, you know, really acting in good faith and trying to challenge the algorithm as much as possible. So there's a paper that came out from Google recently that deals with this issue. Um, and they talk about the importance of stress tests and increasing the rigor of validation. 
Um, I think in pathology, probably the most important stress test is you know, external data sets. And I think that suggests we need to get better at kind of sharing data with each other um, to look at how algorithms perform you know, in other conditions. Um, you know, injecting variability in data by artificial means, you know, using GANs or things or, um, you know, scanning slides uh, on multiple scanners and evaluating that way. But then also, you know, breaking down validation measurements, not just um, in terms of the whole data set, but in, in terms of subsets, you know, how does it perform on men versus women or different sort of histologic subtypes? And just really, I think, kind of, you know, doing those things that are not so hard to do, but just require sort of an extra step. So, so I'm going to shift now to kind of talking about uh, more kind of applications and examples. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we've done in the last three years is focused on how do we deal with time to event data. So if we have genomic data or imaging data and things like, um, you know, time to progression or overall survival, how can we train algorithms that learn from that data? And so there was someone who looked at this kind of in the early 90s and concluded it really wasn't uh, worth using neural networks for this. And then in 2016, we, we looked at sort of high dimensional data and some of the more modern neural networks and found that actually uh, this is quite effective of an approach. So um, we have a paper in the ICL workshop that describes that. And so we've looked at, you know, genomic profiles, protein expression. Um, some of the work we did uh, in our paper in PNAS looks at how we can take HE sections from uh, brain tumor patients and combine those with genomic data and predict clinical outcomes. And so we showed that you know, these convolutional uh, survival networks uh, can essentially perform as well um, as pathologists grade in predicting clinical outcomes uh, when looking at TCGA data. So one of the outcomes of that study was to look at you know, how we can visualize what the algorithm might be focusing on. And so you can take a whole slide image and you can apply this survival convolutional network to different patches all over the image and kind of paint and look at the areas that correspond to high risk versus low risk and try to reason about um, what the algorithm might be focusing on. So here we have a, a region that I've highlighted, region one. It has a, sort of this red band through the middle uh, and, and blue on the top and on the bottom. And so these areas of blue are interestingly, they're, they're tumor, they you know, oligodendroglial tumor. And in the center, we have sort of an acellular edema. So this is what swelling looks like um, under the microscope. So um, for some reason, this algorithm is associating edema with a high risk. And we could think of reasons why that might be true. Um, you might have swelling if you have a very fast growing tumor. But it also could be that this algorithm is just confusing edema for some other pattern. We don't really know why it's painting this area red. And so I think you know, the reason I included this is just to show that even if you do interpretability with these systems, you look at saliency, it doesn't really explain you know, what the algorithm thinks, right? Or why it's giving this explanation. And you know, that was something that was mentioned in this, in this paper by Cynthia Root. And I think she has some very nice uh, figures that illustrate that. So it's good to do interpretability with these black box systems, but there are still limitations if your interpretation is focused on saliency. So, um, you know, another issue with the study is that, um, you know, when you deal with clinical outcomes, there are confounders and, and it's really, you know, difficult to handle that. So, you know, we wanna train directly on clinical outcomes because we wanna overcome limitations of things like grading. But when we're doing that, you know, it's really fraught with a lot of problems. So, you know, for the computer science people out there, if you want to understand this, uh, Rich Guana, who's at uh, Microsoft Research, has a paper called Friends Don't Let Friends Deploy Black Box Models. And what they show is that if you don't really think about these confounders carefully, you can get kind of counterintuitive recommendations from models. So, you know, recommending treatment that is probably very bad, actually. So the example they used is looking at an MO model that uh, suggests interventions for patients that are diagnosed with pneumonia. And so uh, if you have asthma and you have pneumonia, you're typically treated very aggressively. And if the model looks at that data, it will learn that asthma is associated with good outcomes. And it would recommend that asthmatics should receive um, you know, less aggressive treatment, right? So that's an example of a confounder. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a simple example. I think nobody would really, you know, take that advice seriously. But you know, if you're dealing with like, you know, genomic data and, and all, all other kinds of, you know, data and black box models, there might be more subtle things happening. 
So, you know, any kind of good diagnosis essentially introduces this confounding problem. So, you know, there's a lot of focus right now on causal analysis to try to deal with this problem. And, and Mike mentioned that. Um, these causal analysis problems are, are extremely hard to deal with. So um, sometimes we don't know causative relationships and so you have to infer them. Um, you have to sometimes look at a patient and say, what would happen if we had given a different treatment? What would their course have been? And those are really hard things to do. And so I think, you know, I don't expect that we would see like a magic bullet, like deep learning worked for pattern recognition. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to have a magic bullet for causal analysis, at least anytime soon. So, you know, these are things that you can't really like teach a pigeon to do, right, to reason about um, causality, where you can teach a pigeon to in some way, you know, interpret images, um, maybe not very reliably, but they have some pattern recognition capability. So, you know, this is a, a different area of machine learning. I'm excited to see, you know, people working on this, but I think it's going to be a very long uh, and protected battle to try to solve these problems. So um, talk a little bit about our work and looking at uh, the tumor microenvironment in breast cancer. And so uh, our student Muhammad has done a lot of work looking at how um, characterizing a patient's immune system and immune cells within their tumor uh, can predict the future course of their disease. And so this is something you can observe in an h &E slide. And so what you see here in the middle, this is a, a region of tumor and all these little tiny round black cells uh, surrounding this are uh, cells from the immune system. And so, you know, it may be that the immune system is attacking the cancer in this case. And it turns out that if you look at these immune cells, it is correlated with clinical outcomes. So if the patient's immune system is mobilized and it's recognizing the tumor, you would expect those patients to have um, better prognosis. So our friend uh, Roberto Salgado leads an international working group where they've developed sort of manual systems for scoring these cells. And a lot of this scoring rules are focused on kind of practicality. So what are the measurements that you can reproducibly produce as a human in a reasonable amount of time? And so I think this is really a nice opportunity for computational pathology. Um, we could help improve reproducibility of those measurements, but maybe kind of go beyond um, just those measurements that are practical for pathologists. And so I think, you know, not alluded to a lot of that in his work, looking at um, spatial clustering and different kind of spatial metrics. Um, some of the work that Muhammad has done is just to look at how things like abundance of these cells can predict outcomes. And he showed, you know, working with Roche, um, you know, how you can, you know, essentially reproduce the scoring of breast cancer experts of these immune cells very reliably. Uh, and how just simple measurements of abundance in, in a disease like triple negative breast cancer can be, you know, tremendously prognostic. So, you know, if you have a lot of these immune cells, uh, maybe we can sort of dial back your treatment and uh, forego some of those negative side effects. So uh, one of the things that we did with this working group is to sort of talk about, you know, what would we do if we were going to try to sort of advance these algorithms into the clinic. And I think it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. And so how would we implement the clinical standards uh, for TIL scoring in an algorithm? How would we advance some type of algorithm like that through the validation pipeline? So pathologists have sort of rules for validating tests. And you know, how could we you know, enhance uh, those algorithms and go beyond those sort of um, you know, recommendations from the working group uh, but still have something that could be used clinically. And so I think if you're a pathologist, this is kind of a nice paper to look at. It's got a ton of authors and uh, went through a lot of edits. And so there's, I think, a lot of uh, interesting thoughts in there about how to you know, translate these algorithms clinically. Um, so a lot of that in ways depends on our ability to generate you know, markups of structures and images for training algorithms. And so I think that's an area where we're, we're looking very carefully and there's a lot of intense focus. Um, you know, there's a lot of these efficient annotation tools that have been published recently. Uh, our friend Andrew, who works closely with the Knot, has published something called Quick Annotator, where you can sort of, you know, put this in the hands of a pathologist and they can very quickly, uh, you know, delineate cells from or new cell nuclei from background or, you know, more complex multicellular regions. There's a tool that's similar that's out of uh, Nasser Rajput's group uh, in the UK. And then someone uh, in Buffalo has taken a system we developed called Histomics DK and kind of sort of added that capability. 
So this is sort of one of these commoditization trends where you, know, you don't need to know how machine learning works to be able to annotate and train these systems. And so I think that's a very interesting trend. Uh, sort of what we focused on is how to develop software that can allow us to do distributed annotation studies with large numbers of experts, combinations of experts and medical students, you know, with leveraging people, you know, all over the world, essentially. And so we have a platform that's been developed with David Goodman and, and David Manthe from Kitware, um, where it's a centralized server, we can host images. Um, people can see those images. We have sort of access control and a really nice permissions model. And then we can sort of monitor all of this activity using an API uh, that allows us to see, you know, what people are, um, you know, doing and, and how they compare with experts and how much progress that we're making. So uh, we've used this system to look at annotating tissue regions in breast cancer. And so this was kind of our first foray into this area. Our student went and recruited people on social media, got about 25 people and sort of gave them basic training in breast cancer histology. And then they were supervised by pathologists and pathology residents. And so we triaged slides and, and essentially picked uh, regions of interest and then gave them to these people and said, go and annotate these. And so uh, this allowed us to generate data for training algorithms, uh, but also for sort of looking at how well, um, you know, non-experts uh, can perform in different tasks and how we might leverage them in future studies. What are their limitations? And all this data is publicly available, by the way. So, uh, you know, there's some interesting results. Uh, you could really, I think, rely pretty well on non-experts for doing, you know, predominant tissue classes. So things like tumor regions, they tend to do very well. They only disagree very slightly at, at boundaries of, of uh, tumor regions. Um, some things like infiltrating immune cells that don't have a clear boundary, it's a little more fuzzy. And so you get a lot more inner observer variability there. Um, some of the rare classes, things like nerve or uh, blood vessels, you can't really expect medical students to reliably annotate those. So but we do get a lot of value for things like stroma and tumor. And I think that that turned out quite nicely. Um, so when you train an algorithm based on these annotations, it's interesting, there's a lot of noise. So some people are more sensitive, some people are more specific. And I think we found that these deep learning algorithms are very good at learning from this kind of noisy data. So these are all computational predictions I'm showing you on the left. These um, uh, fully convolutional networks are very good at finding the boundary between say stroma and tumor and at identifying pockets of lymphocytes. Um, and I think, you know, these results the tell that they're not really generated by human is that they're somewhat too detailed. So humans tend to make smoother boundaries. Uh, algorithms don't really think about conserving energy. So they just, you know, go wild and, and annotate everything and leave in little tiny pockets of cells. Uh, some of the challenge that we've been uh, working on recently is annotating nuclei in, in breast cancer using the same data set. And so we have a paper that, uh, you know, should be on archive fairly soon, where we've looked at annotating over 200,000 uh, nuclei using TCGA. So we have 12 nuclear classes. Um, one of the interesting things about this study is we used a very weak algorithm uh, to generate suggestions for these reviewers, and then uh, looked at how those suggestions bias them. And it turns out the suggestions don't bias people too much, but it really can increase efficiency. And so that's one of the ways we were able to get over 200,000 annotated nuclei. So um, you can you know, train networks on that. We used just sort of a very variation of mask RCNN that was tweaked in some specific ways. But this is you know, essentially an off the shelf algorithm uh, with some minor modifications. And if you just give it a bunch of data, it works really well. Um, you don't really need to go off and design something completely new. Uh, you can just focus on collecting data and then have you know, essentially pretty good performance at the end. So that's kind of interesting inflection point where, you know, there's more emphasis on kind of the data collection part than there is on the algorithm design. And so uh, we see that kind of happening more and more. Um, you know, we've also done this in, in other diseases. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this, but we've done a lot of work looking at bone marrow uh, specimens. This is something that is done a lot in pathology. You have to sort of go in and count different kinds of cells. There's like you know, at least 13 kinds of cells you would wanna measure. And so this is a really good task for an algorithm. It's kind of challenging because the cells are closely packed, but this is something where um, you know, we would expect computational pathology would be 
uh, you know, applied in it, you know, early on. And, you know, we collected, I think, 24,000 cells and found that if you just take, you know, off the shelf algorithms with actually no modifications, um, you can get, you know, extremely good detection accuracy, um, extremely good classification accuracy. So this is all using data from a single hospital. Um, one of the things we're going to do now is to look at, you know, how this performs on our Northwestern cases and to see, you know, how quickly it breaks down and how much additional training data we need to adapt that algorithm locally. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, so the, I think the comments I have, you know, things that, that we're really thinking about is, you know, how can we as a community organize to build large shared data repositories? And so this, these would include images, they would include, you know, clinical data outcomes, you know, annotation data as well. And so I think many of you are probably familiar with the big picture project in Europe, their goal is to generate a public data set of, you know, a million whole slide images that people can come and analyze. Um, you know, these things could be more focused, kind of looking at, you know, orienting around a community that's interested in a disease like kidney. Um, but I think that's really a limitation right now is this, is this data. You know, if you work at a big hospital, you can generate this data. Uh, if you're some computer scientist out there who's very talented, you know, it, it, it's still very hard, I think, to get your hands on this stuff. And so there's a lot of challenges we need to overcome in terms of privacy. Um, do we, you know, bring the computing to the, to the images? Do we, you know, find a way to disseminate the images? Um, and, you know, who would pay for, for all of that in each case? Um, I think also, you know, increasing our engagement with the ML and CS communities like this workshop is trying to do, uh, you know, data access is a big thing. Um, I'm personally interested in training and how do we get engineers, you know, to understand what are the interesting problems and, you know, stop trying to solve kind of things that have been done a hundred times before, um, you know, and how can we develop coursework that will attract people to our field like happened to me, you know, roughly 10 years ago. Um, and then also, you know, how can we improve tooling? So I think a big problem is, you know, even if you have access to the images, it's not like dealing with JPEGs or PNGs. Uh, things like PyTorch and TensorFlow are not made to work with whole slide images. So certainly standardizing formats would be helpful, but in the meantime, um, how can we make these images easier to ingest into machine learning pipelines? Um, another thing we talk about a lot is how can we make attempts at prospective use or studies? And so, you know, for so long, we were focused on algorithm performance and accuracy. Um, and now that we're starting to see, I think, some breakthroughs there, we need to maybe shift a little bit of focus to what do we need to do to use these things? And how do we study the ways that pathologists like to interact with these? And I think until you really try some of this stuff, um, you won't really know what the problems are. And, and these, this will definitely provide feedback to um, algorithm design. So, you know, you need to figure out a lot of logistical things like, you know, platforms for presenting results to pathologists, how does the computing happen? And I think, you know, working through those in some kind of promising use cases could be really uh, illuminating. So the last comment I'll make is, you know, we are, have a roadmap for digital pathology implementation at Northwestern. So we've just purchased, I think, seven slide scanners. And so we have sort of a phased approach that will start small looking at some of our quality initiatives and using digital path and tumor boards, um, and then moving forward towards, you know, primary diagnosis uh, and sort of full digital archiving. So, um, you know, we're excited about that. And, you know, how can we really, I think, build up research informatics to make this data useful for research and simplify a lot of those problems of using these images in research. So just acknowledge some of our trainees. I won't go through everybody here, but you know, we've had a, a nice team. A lot of these people have moved on to you know, either fellowships or industry uh, faculty positions, um, but it's been a pleasure to work with everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lee, for a, a really inspiring and wonderful talk. Didn't expect anything less from you. So really, you know, very illuminating. As, as some, I think Mike or somebody said on the uh, on the on the chat. So we still have about six minutes left, right? So if anybody has any questions for Dr. Cooper, you know, please, you know, please uh, do ask them. So Lee, could I? Uh, is it uh, are you at liberty to discuss which which of the vendor platforms you're going to be using for your digital pathology framework uh, infrastructure at Northwestern? 
Sure. I mean, we, I think we've decided that a Perio um, you know, is, is the, the vendor we're going to go with. So uh, we have a research scanner that we've purchased with some philanthropy. Um, those things aren't here yet, but um, that's what we're, we're going to use. So a single, single uh, vendor, uh, both for research and for clinical? Yeah, I, I just thought it was easier to standardize that, you know, in terms of dealing with, um, you know, the tech staff, right? So I'm kind of a little bit on both sides of this. And so it just makes my life easier not having to interface with two different vendors. Uh, yeah, do we have time for another question? Yes, yes, Ross, we do. Yeah, yeah good talk, Lee, thanks. Um, the, um, you know, you, a lot of people like to make fun of these black box sort of solutions and machine learning is, you know, somehow implicated in all this. But I mean, I think even the example you brought up of asthma, to me, isn't so much a problem with the solution, but a problem with the, the way the solution was applied and the way the training data was set up. And, you know, to me, I wonder if it doesn't speak more to sort of the group of people that did that and you know, how it was evaluated and so forth. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on that because it seems to me it's not so much a problem with machine learning as it is the way in which people fed data in and didn't account for these confounding factors. Yeah, so are you, are you talking specifically about the clinical outcomes or some of the, just the, the general like frailties of deep learning? Yeah, I mean, the general frailties of any analysis, yeah. that any kind of, any kind of fitting, yeah. right? That doesn't account for, right. you, know, you, didn't, you didn't need machine learning to make that mistake, right? Yeah. Of, of like, let's say the asthma patients being treated more aggressively and having better outcomes. No, I mean, that's, that's that was a mistake in kind of understanding the data. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, other things would be like if you're doing a dis uh, like a disease classifier and all your healthy subjects come from one hospital and all your disease subjects come from another, you know, you're going to have a big, big problem, right? And so, clinical studies are full of these kinds of mistakes. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, 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 I would argue, and you don't need, these happened way before machine learning came into, you know, I, I do, you know, some of the work in human uh, brain imaging is full of these kinds of paradoxes of studies that went wrong because of a lack of understanding of confounders, right? So speaking as an engineer, I think one big problem is that we don't really get good training in experimental design, like people who come from, you know, biology background or even maybe chemistry. Uh, and, you know, we're not really taught about a lot of this stuff. It's just like focus on the technical aspects. And, 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 and I would argue it has something to do with the teams of people that are working on these problems. In yeah. other words, yeah, it's fine to have an engineer on there, but you really need biostatisticians and people who are trained in these kinds of studies to help identify these pitfalls. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we need to, you know, enhance curriculum and just sort of help proliferate this knowledge that, you know, you can lose before you even start. Right. And, and what are the sort of the common pitfalls, right? Um, even if you're thinking carefully, you know, the, it's easy for some of these things to slip past people. So um, I, I just wanted to point something out. There was a comment from uh, my friend Andre in Japan who said that this, this citation about workforce shortage in the United States is actually not true. So I'm gonna to have to look that up. I just wanted to bring that up as a possible correction. If that's true, it's a big deal because that's a lot of the rationale for doing some of this stuff. I think Anil has some other numbers too. Maybe I think it might be worth checking with Anil, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to look into that. Okay. Because I think we, you know, I think he has brought it up a few times and and I don't mean to put Anil on the spot, but I think it's worth discussing. That's all I'm trying to say. No, I think I, um, there, there are, there is published uh, data from AMI and other sources where which outline the shortage of pathologists. Yeah. Okay. So, so we need to figure out, you know, like what Andre is talking about. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We have, still have one minute left. So I have maybe a comment, right? Seems like the biggest thing you're, you know, you're essentially saying is that one of the biggest things you're saying is data, right? We need. So maybe you know, would you would you really advocate along with many of us, 
like make this workshop, make the resources from this workshop in a, a repository for more data. Yeah, and I think you know the theme of the second workshop is going to be data. So right. um, part of this reason for bringing these things up was to kind of prime us for that. Right, right, um, right, I right. Think, yeah, as a as a consortium, you know, you know, you could explore how to do that. I think it's like I mentioned, there are challenges about you know where is it stored and and then where does the computing happen? Are people downloading you know terabytes of images and doing computing locally, or are they working in the cloud? If they're working on the cloud, who's paying for the cloud storage? So, you know, we, we should try to work through some of those things. Maybe. Exactly, and I mean, even if like you have, uh, let's say, a certain type of cancer in TCJ, it's usually not enough, and it's you know not. It's very general. I think I think there is a need for more specific, you know, disease specific, you know, repositories. Yeah, TCJ is nice, but they're all they're all very advanced stage disease. So. Yes, yes, especially for condition. yeah. Sorry, go ahead, please. I apologize. Oh, no, no, I just said that's a big limitation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we should probably stop now because, you know, we, we should go on to the next lecture. But thank you so much, Lee. Okay, I really appreciate the great talk. And, you know, thank you for also doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. So...